if you look on the back of your bulletin, there is a kind of an outline of the sermons that we'll be doing for the month of February concerning the sanctity of human life. We will not be talking about abortion for four weeks. This will just be the topic for this week, and after that it will be different topics concerning people made in the image of God. Also, I do want to make a disclaimer before we get started in it this month. I think Dr. Adrian Rogers, the late Adrian Rogers, said it the best. He said, Christians should not f marry themselves to a political party. Christians should be free to tell any political party or incumbent or anything what is right and what is true, what is righteous and what is unrighteous. So our allegiance is not to a political party. Our allegiance is ultimately to Christ. So all that we're saying this morning has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with a political party. It has everything to do with the Word of God and who God has called us as believers to view life. And so I wanted that to be our disclaimer before we got started today that I do not have a political hidden agenda with this. This is just what the Bible says. So if you would turn with me, we're going to be reading in Psalm 139. And that's where we'll start this morning. So Psalm 139, beginning in verse 1, it says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are a light to you. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wondrous and I know them well. My bones are not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before, before a single one of them began. God, how precious your thoughts are to me, how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Kaylee read our, that those middle verses this morning, verse 13 and 14, that kind of focus on this idea that we were knit together in our mother's womb by God and we were created wonderfully. And we see that creation began in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So the question that we're going to ask ourselves this morning is, when does life begin? If you ever looked up random weird laws, and anybody ever do that before? Um, we had a teacher one time that did that, and that kind of caught my interest. And there's weird laws about, you know, if you have a wagon... And you're pulling a horse, you can only ride the wagon on the right, you know, on the left side, down certain street. There's just weird laws. They're still in the books across states. And it's just really funny. But one of the laws that 
I, you know, we came across that's pretty popular when it comes to talking about when does life begin is you have the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act of 1972, which the Protection Act is, it says, the civil penalty provision was added stating anyone who takes, possesses, transports, sells, barters, or purchases any dead or live bald e golden eagles will be fined $5,000 for violation. In addition, he or she who violates or disturbs any egg or nest will be, f will be fined under the Civil Penalty Act. So even science has to admit that at conception something different has happened. There is an act that has taken place, so much so that they know to protect eggs of eagles and those type things. So even science speaks to this understanding that at conception something is happening that is different. It is unique. Something there that wasn't there before. So our starting point and our conclusion this morning that we'll work through the rest of the sermon is that life begins at conception. To answer that question, when does life begin? We believe through Scripture that life begins at conception. And if life begins at conception, how does that impact our view of pregnancy? How does that impact our views on culturally accepted practices and policies? We believe ultimately God should determine how we view life. And that doesn't just begin at conception, but from our homes to our families, to our job, to our church, to the food we eat, God should be playing a role in our everyday life. And this really does include how we view human life as a whole. And given our American culture, we can't talk about the value of life without addressing when does life begin. So I'm going to read a few verses to you that throughout Scripture. These are not all the verses that speak to this, but these are a few that recognize where we see God recognizes life within the womb. We read Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. He says, I, he, the psalmist is saying, God, you knit me together in my inner parts in my mother's womb. And then you have Jeremiah 1, verse 4 through 5. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. In Job 31, 15, it says, Did not the one who made me in the womb also make me them? Did not the same God form us both in the womb? Luke 1, 41 through 45, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 25, 23, it says, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. In Galatians 1, 15 through 16, it says, But when God, whom from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, so that I could preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. In Isaiah 49, 1-5, it says, Coasts and islands, listen to me. Distant peoples, pay attention. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. And then down in verse 5, it says, And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. Psalm 22, verse 9 through 10. It was you who brought me out of the womb, making me secure at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Those are just a few samplings of the scriptures that we find throughout the Bible that speak that God recognizes life within the mother's womb. And so our conclusion must be based on those verses that what is inside the mother's womb is indeed life. But because of our culture and the, and the country we live in, we do have to address the topic of abortion and how that fits within Scripture. Ultimately, what abortion says, it says, if I want my baby, my baby is a person. If I don't want my baby, it is not a person. If I want her, it's illegal to kill her. If I don't want her, it is legal to kill her. Therefore, the personhood of my body and her right 
to be protected under the law are defined by my sovereign desire. The might of my will is the right to kill. See, abortion is about who decides when life begins. Is it the mother? Is it the father? Is it the doctor or nurses? Is it the government? Or is it God? I believe, based on these scriptures, that life begins, and whether it's a life or not, is determined by God. I want to read a story to you. I did post this story on our Facebook page, but in case you didn't get there, this is about a couple who, uh, well, we'll just read the story. This is, a, this is a true story from a couple in the Memphis, Tennessee area. It says, this article says, 10 years ago, Chad and Christy Hall went to the doctor. 12-month-old Carson is in tow for a routine ultrasound to find out whether the 17-week-old baby growing in Christy's womb was a boy or a girl. Two minutes into the ultrasound, the nurse stopped and said four words the Halls will never forget. This is not good. The doctor began going over the scenarios and told Chad and Christy that the outlook was very grim due to a severely low level of amniotic fluid. The direction the doctor was suggesting became clear to not continue with the pregnancy. We told the doctor that abortion is just not going to be an option for us, Chad said. God has given us this baby and God will be glorified through this no matter what because He is good. The Lord gave Christy a verse she prayed throughout the pregnancy, delivery, delivery and over the 10 years that followed. Ephesians 3.20, she said, became my life verse. I just kept praying, now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Two weeks later, the fetal, special, the fetal specialist could not believe what he was seeing. Christy's amniotic fluid had gone from a level 1 to a level 10. Chad and Christy knew in that moment, despite their fears, that God was faithful and His hand was on them. On February 28, 2004, about six weeks before his due date, Caleb was brought into the world. Ten years later, Caleb is thankful his parents chose to pray for him and speak for him. Caleb said, I did not have a voice. I couldn't say anything. But my mom and dad spoke for me and prayed for me. Since God let me live, I know He is doing, going to do something great with me. And now, Chad and Christy have three children. Carson, Caleb, and Chase. Caleb has big plans on being a missionary or a preacher. Christy said, Caleb is our exceedingly abundantly. God has done more in him than we could have ever hoped or imagined. What we're finding is that science is finally starting to catch up with Scripture, especially when it comes to abortion. Back in when Roe v. Wade was passed, we did not have 3D ultrasounds. We did not have the ability to look into the womb. We couldn't see that babies run from needles and they experience pain. We didn't know that at eight weeks, not only was there a heartbeat, but all the organs are functioning and they have brain activity. And now they're starting to believe that babies dream as early as eight weeks. Now the Bible is not on its own a scientific textbook as you would think of a scientific textbook. But whenever the Bible speaks to science, it is true and it is right. God said that He recognized life in the womb. We have called up with technology that we can see that yes, there is a life in the womb that experiences pain that dreams, that is living. See, God created each person unique for His glory. So we must be careful using the medical field or our political affiliations to determine what is a viable life. And beloved, some of the blame 
of where we are as a nation with the abortion industry falls at the feet of the church. We have not been faithful to proclaim the gospel to all people. We must be faithful to bring hope to the hopeless. We must bring grace and mercy to the broken. We have slacked on our mission. We never know what leads people to certain moments in their life. But too many times the church has spent more time judging and condemning people than loving them and caring for them. Not everybody has a support system at home. Not everybody has family that can take them in and care for them and help them through life. That's what the church is for. The church is for the broken and the hopeless. We're to come alongside them and care for them and encourage them. I started thinking, as a church, how many of us have been faithful to share the gospel this past week? How many of us are praying through and have a plan this week to share the gospel with someone specifically? If we truly believe that a broken world needs hope, needs forgiveness, then we can only come to the conclusion that they need Jesus above all. They don't need our words of hate. They don't need condemnation. They need Jesus. We can't expect people to act like Jesus if they don't know who they are. If they don't know who Jesus is, how can we expect it? We can't expect people to clean up their lives and then come to church. That's not what church is all about. That's not what Jesus did. He brought them broken, hopeless, and in all their mess. And He gives them forgiveness. And He gives them new life. Then He holds them to a standard. Not before. Now I do want to take a moment and speak about those that may have had abortions or you know someone who has had abortions. We, the words that we can simply say is that God loves you. See, 1 John 1, 9 says if we can... Confess our sins, He is faithful and just, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish or have, but have everlasting life. Romans 10.9 says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. Those are just as much for you as they are for anyone else. What we've done poorly as a church is we have classified sins and said this sin is worse than my sin. But in reality, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all equally in need of God's forgiveness. We are all in equally in need of the righteousness of Christ to be put on our account. But I will say there are certain sins that we as a church as a whole have tended to put that those are the disgusting, evil, vile sins that are worse than all others. That is not biblical. It says, for all have sinned. All sin causes us to fall short. Whether you think it's just a little white lie, that's still a sin that's worthy of death. So as a church, we must be willing to bring hope and forgiveness to all people. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to provide the hope of the gospel to all people. So if you have had an abortion, you are not less than in any of us. God sees you the same as He would see any of us. He looks at you and He loves you. No less because of what you've done. And that's for all people. So church, we must do a better job of showing people the same grace 
and mercy that God has shown us. So we must spend our time pointing people to Christ rather than condemning them to hell. But we still have to call sin, sin. But we can't call out sin unless we're willing to proclaim the solution to that sin. To call out sin without the gospel is evil. That's like a doctor coming to you and saying, you're dying. And then leaving while he has the cure sitting right there on the table without ever giving it to you. We would consider that evil. We would consider that wrong. And so beloved, that is true for the church as well. To condemn sin without sharing the gospel is evil. So what we would say about abortion, to recap, is that we would say that when does life begin? We'll say that is determined by God. And God determines that life begins in the womb at conception. So what's the root of the problem? What leads people ultimately to abortion or to taking life in their own hand? Why is there a need for abortion in our land? The vast majority of abortions are used for birth control. Some years, somewhere between 95 to 98 percent of all abortions are simply birth control related. It's just I decided not to have a baby at this time. A lot of people will say, well, what about incest? What about rape? Those type things. Most years, that's less than 1% of all abortions. So the issue is our views and our values concerning sex. Our culture is obsessed with it. It's in our commercials. It's in our TV shows. It's in our movies. It's on our computers. It's in our workplace. It's on our billboards. It's in our art. It's everywhere. Sexual immorality demands abortion. We will never be able to battle abortion until we battle sexual immorality. Because ultimately all abortion is, is an attempt to remove the consequences of sex. So... What is God's plan for sexuality? In Genesis 2 and verse 24 it says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. In 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 7, 5 it says, Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with them both. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. In Hebrews 13.4 it says, Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-8 For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor and not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take action advantage of a brother or sister in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all, the, all of these offenses, as we also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live life in holiness. 
Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects God who gives you the Holy Spirit. God has a plan and design for your sexuality. And we learned from Ephesians that we are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual battle. Our adversary, our enemy, desires to destroy the things of God. God designed our sexuality be to ex be expressed within marriage between a man and a woman. But our culture says that sexuality can be expressed in numerous ways. So it goes back to who do we, who do we allow to find what sexual immorality is? Ourselves? Hollywood? The world? Our government? Or does God? I believe God dis determines our sexuality and what is sexually immoral. Some of the things that are plaguing, not those outside the church, but those in the church specifically. Pornography, adultery, and sex before marriage. Statistically, there is no difference between those in the church and those outside the church when it comes to those statistics. Sometimes they're higher. We have ignored God's plan for sexuality for far too long. We haven't been willing to speak about what God's plan is. And we need to be praying that Christians are filled with the Spirit so much so that it grieves them when they step outside God's plan for their life. The problem is, is the church, we can't hold each other accountable because we're doing the same things. Like I said, the statistics on pornography and sex before marriage are sometimes higher in the church than those outside the church. We must stand up and start there. We must be willing to teach the next generation what God says, not based on our words alone, but mostly based upon our actions. The next generation is watching what we do. They see what we do. They see what we value. They're not listening to you. They're watching you. And they see it. They're not as dumb and blind to these things as we think. If you ask any teenager, they'll tell you they know everything. Right? Right? They see what you're doing. They see that these things are prevalent in the church. And so it becomes prevalent in their generation as well. Studies have shown that core values and beliefs and worldviews are mostly developed by the age 12. This is why family ministries are so, so important to the church. We don't have decades upon decades to instill in the next generation what it means to be a follower of God. We have one short window. And your actions, our actions will speak much more volume than our words ever will. At home, do they see you on the computer doing things and looking at things you shouldn't? Or do they see you reading your Bible and praying? Being in student ministry for 18 years, I can tell you countless stories of children who stumbled onto the computer and found what daddy or mommy was looking at earlier. They find those things and they don't tell you. You do not hide things from your kids as well as you think you do. They see them. More times than not, children will ultimately value what their parents value. Not what the parents say they value, but how they live their life value.
So brothers and sisters, ultimately I would say that one action has more impact than a thousand words. It's time for us to act upon God's Word. See, when we redefine family and sex, it produces things like abortion. So if we truly want to end abortion and those type things, we must invest in families and help them in developing a biblical view of sexuality for the next generation. It takes action, not words. The next generation needs to see you dedicated and living all of your life for the glory of God. That's what they need. That's what the church needs. To recap, in closing Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, it says, For it was you, God, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know them well. God has made you. He has created you wonderfully and amazingly so that you can experience His love and so that you can glorify Him with your life. You were not created for this world. You were created for the world to come. So I encourage you to live all of your life for God's glory and not your own. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you now and we reflect upon your word and, and we think about this idea of when life begins and, and how you view us and how you love us. Help us to remember and to know that every life is precious. That every person is created in your image and that you love us and you love everyone. So Lord, help us to love everyone. Help us to reach out and show grace and mercy to the broken and to the hopeless. Help us to take the good news of the gospel to all people, despite who they are, where they've come from, or what their past may be. Lord, help us to be faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And help us in all of our life to remember that you are the one that determines our values and how we view life. And give us a spirit of faithfulness. Help us to step out in action, following you and glorifying you with every single aspect of our life so that we can teach the next generations what it means to be loved and to live for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.